So we ended off last class with noticing the pattern of the power rule that if you have a power and you want to find the derivative, it can be as simple as bringing the power in front as a coefficient and subtracting one from an exponent. So we've got f of x equals x to the power of 7. The derivative would be 7x to the 6. Now imagine if you did the limit. Limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. You would have to expand x plus h to the 7. Oh. Right, you could go down to Pascal's triangle until you get eight, eight terms and use that and expand it completely to get nine. I mean, this is going to have eight terms in the end, and then the x to the sevens would cancel out, and you could factor out an h, and the h's would cancel out, and lo and behold, it would become 7x to the six. But this is a little bit faster, right? When I said we would shave off you know, if the question took us five minutes, we would shave off four minutes and 55 seconds. That's pretty powerful. Imagine doing this one. No, you don't want to even imagine it. And we're done. So I'm playing around with some different notations here. You can write the derivative as f prime of x, or you can write the derivative as dy dx. It, uh, it doesn't matter. They both mean the same thing. Um, some things to look at. If we look at the first question, it was written in function notation, so it's more typical to write the derivative as f prime of x if the function was written as f of x. And when a function is written as y equals, it's either more typical to write it as dy dx equals or y prime. So both of those would be fine. No, if you did if you did the other notation, they would accept it. So now sometimes we can't use it directly because the power rule only works if you have a power. And right now we have one over a power. But if you can use your exponent laws and stuff that you've learned from the past, you might say, I can change this to be x to the negative 3. And in this unit, you will get very good at subtracting 1, OK? Because you always have to subtract 1 from the exponent. But this will be one that you, get, you tend to make mistakes. What happens when you subtract 1 from the exponent? You get minus 4. Can you see yourself being tempted to put minus 2? Because you're just thinking subtract one. No, Jake, I'm never going <laughs> to. And you could either write it with the negative exponent or change it back to have a positive exponent. What would you do with a square root? The 3 has to stay in the numerator, because that negative 4 is only to the x. So we have to be careful with that, that right now that exponent of negative 4 is only the x, so only the x can move to your denominator and become x to the positive 4. The negative 3 would have to stay in your numerator. If you had a square root, don't need that extra there. How can you write a square root as a power? x to the 1 over 2. Again, here's some different kind of function notation. Just getting used to different notations. And then we can apply the power rule. Bring the 1 half in front and write it as x to the negative half.
or you could put that x to the negative half on the bottom with a positive exponent, or you could change that x to the one half to a square root again. If you had to do the definition of the derivative with a square root, do you remember the special thing that we did on the definition of the derivative with a square root? Like you would have this limit as h goes to 0 of square root of x plus h minus the square root of x all over h. We did one of these with the definition and it used a different strategy. You remember? You multiply by close with the word. He's got the right idea but the wrong words. You multiply by this. What's this called? Yes. Now it's important to remember the words because if we can name something, this is true for any subject, if you can give a name to something, if you can say, oh, multiply by the conjugate, if you can say that, your chances of knowing what that means increase and your chances of remembering it increase rather than, oh, you just do that thingy, right? Because you do a lot of thingies in a lot of places and then they get mixed up and then you end up forgetting them. But if you can say the right words, if we can take the time to say, oh, I've got to remember that that's the conjugate, chances are you're going to remember it better. So we have 1 over the cube root of x to the 4. So we could change the cube root of x to the 4 to 1 over x to the 4 thirds, which then we could use our negative exponent law and bring it to the top and get a power. So again, the power rule only works if we get a single power in our numerator. Then you bring that coefficient out in front, and like I said, you're going to get really good at subtracting 1. Negative 4 thirds subtract 1. So again, how do we subtract fractions? Got to get a common denominator. So negative 4 thirds minus 3 over 3. Get that negative 7 thirds. And you could write it like this, or you could write it like this, or you could write it like that. And so we have this little helpful hint at the bottom that whenever you have radicals, we're going to change them to rational exponents to help us out. That's the power rule. That's our first of many derivative rules so that we don't have to use the definition and we can save hours and hours of time. Now, when you get to university, you'll probably be asked if you take a first year calculus course to prove the power rule or the different rules that we do, they're going to say you need to prove it in the general sense. So that would mean, and we're not going to do it right now, but you would have to take the definition and say if I had x plus h to the n minus x to the n over h, where n is any number, could I do it? Could I figure it out? And what would it look like? And how would I do it? So it would be a lot of, if I make it, until you get to h to the n. You would have to show the binomial expansion with like a lot of dot, dot, dots. And then say, oh, here, now, I said I wasn't going to do it, and I'm ending up doing more than I want to. Okay, if you used this, are you okay with that for combinations, right? So you would have, you would probably show more of your binomial theorem expanded, probably a couple more terms, and then you could factor out the h. Can you see that it's going to be right here, our answer in the end, every single time that we did a power in our definition of the derivative, 
that's where our answer was. n choose 1 is just n minus 1 from the exponent. So in university, there's going to be more of an emphasis on proofs than we have in this course. And, and a lot of students in university get scared and go, I can't do this math, drop out of math, because they see that, not realizing that you're just going to see the proof one day in class and then after that they want you to be able to do questions like this in three steps. And you're like, yeah, that's easy. I can do that. So you don't have to be so scared about the proofs when they get there, okay? Um, not sure at w to what extent usually on the midterms and the final exams they're going to ask you one or two of them, but the rest will be questions like we've seen so far. So, rule number two, a constant multiplied by a function. What happens when we have a number in front? So if you had f of x, instead of just having x squared, which you know what the derivative is, what happens if you had 7x squared? The derivative becomes 14x. Did the rule really change? No. I mean, our Exponent comes out in front, but because there's a number out in front already, they get multiplied. And so we get 14. We still subtract 1 from the exponent. And that is what is being said right here. If there's that number in front, you still bring the n out in front and for the coefficient and subtract 1 from the exponent. f of x equals 4x squared. Twenty-eight x to the six. This is kind of exciting that we're saving like five minutes off of every single question. Right? If I gave you these three questions with the definition of the derivative, I'd have to give you a half an hour. Right? Now we can just sort of go, have you done the other two already? Almost. Did you get negative 10 x to the 4? The last one, you have to do a little bit of work. You have to rearrange things first. So we are change that cube root of x squared to x to the 2 thirds. Then change that x to the 2 thirds to an x to the negative 2 thirds. The 7 and the 3 are not part of that power. They do not change positions. Now, you might be able to multiply this and get negative 14 over 9 right away. That's great. Subtracting 1 from the exponent gives you negative 5 over 3. So you could write your answer. And for the most part, you'll leave your answer like this, negative 14 over 9, x to the negative 5 over 3 because that's what you had. But if it was told you needed positive exponents, a lot of textbooks only write their answers with positive exponents. Or if you wanted to write your answer with radicals, you could do that as well. Yeah? Usually not. Sometimes you'll see write your answer with positive exponents. Okay. But... Uh, One thing you'll find if you, there was, there's sort of an accepted way of writing things, okay? So in mathematics, you know, the word simplify, you know, if you had an answer of 3 over 6, you went to the back of the book, they wouldn't write 3 over 6, they'd write 1 half, they'd simplify it. And so we develop in mathematics all these forms of simplifying. Part of it is so that we can make answer keys at the back of the book and everybody can have the same answer. Right? It's frustrating if you would look at the back of the book and the answer would be different every single time. Sort of like, you know, question one was 2 plus 3. You looked at the back of the book and they had V. And you're like, oh, they're using Roman numerals. Why are they doing that? 
and changing up every single time something different. That would be annoying. So we have in mathematics simplifying things so that they show up the same every time. And one of those things was let's make everything with positive exponents. I'm not sure what's more accepted, the square root form or the positive exponents. I'm going to guess the square root form, but I'd have to look it up. Rule number three. The derivative of a constant is zero. And there's a number of ways we can show this. Remember, okay, the big idea in calculus so far is we're finding the slope of tangent lines to any point on a curve. If you took a constant and thought about its graph, f of x equals 5. That's a horizontal line at 5. If you drew a tangent line to a horizontal line, it would be another horizontal line everywhere. What's the slope of a horizontal line? Zero. So we can show that the derivative of a constant is equal to zero just by thinking about the graph. The graph doesn't change. Its slope is constant. It's always going to be the same. Same thing with lines. You know, if you have y equals mx plus b, the slope of y equals 5x plus 3 is 5. Every tangent line is going to be 5. Could probably make sense why the derivative would always be 5. But we can also see it with the power rule. I could write 5 as 5 times x to the 0. Now, normally we don't like to add extra useless stuff, right? And x to the 0 is just equal to 1. And 5 times 1 is 5. So I'm not really adding anything of substance here. But now, if I wanted to use the power rule, I could bring the 0 out in front, and 0 times 5 is 0, and 0 times anything would be 0. So I could prove that the derivative of constant is 0 using my power rule as well. Right? And if you had y equals mx plus b, oh, I'm getting ahead, teaching too many, too many rules at once. If I wanted to find the derivative of this one, graphically, if you have a line with a slope of 5 and you draw a tangent to a straight line, it's going to be exactly the same as that straight line. It makes sense that the derivative graphically should be 5 every single tangent line at every single point will have a slope of 5. If we use our derivative rules, what's the derivative of 5x? Well, you would have 5x to the 1. If you use your power rule, the 1 would come out in front. You'd subtract 1 from the exponent, and you would get 5. All right. Don't want to get too far ahead too quickly. Could you work backwards? If you had the derivative is 5x to the 4, what would it have been originally? x to the 5. And we're going to find out later that there's more than one answer to this. x to the 5 is one answer. We're going to find out later that x to the 5 plus 1 is another answer. Because what we're going to, another rule that we're going to get to today is that if you're adding and subtracting different things and you want to find the derivative, you can find the derivative of each one separately. What's the derivative of x to the 5? Five? 5x five to the 4. What's the derivative of 1? 0. So that would be another answer. You could also have 17 there, or 173. 
or anything, any constant at the end. So you're going to find out later what we're going to do is we're going to write our general solution as x to the 5 plus c, where c can be any real number. But for now, this just said, find a function that works. x to the 5 is perfectly fine. It didn't say find them all. There. I have already taught this, but this is the next rule. The derivative of a sum or difference. If you have two functions and you're adding or subtracting them and you want to find the derivative, you can find the derivative of each of them separately. Question A. We are adding five different things. Okay? So we can find the derivative of each of them separately. How long does that take to do that question? Maybe seven seconds? Six and three quarters? Not very long, right? Imagine your definition of the derivative. Should I write out the definition of the derivative just so you can see what it would look like? Just to enjoy our new derivative rules that much more? We would have to do the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h, which would be 3x plus h to the 5 plus 2. Oh my goodness, I don't even know if I'm going to have enough room. Minus 7x plus h squared plus x plus h minus 5. That's just f of x plus h. Then we would have to minus f of x. x to the 5 minus x plus x to the 4 minus 7x squared plus x minus 5 all over h. Then you would have to expand each of those, gather all of your like terms, factor out an h, cancel out your h, apply your limit, and you would get this answer, which we found in 6 and 3 quarter seconds. Do you like the new rules better than the definitions? <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, the definition's not... Well, it's not, no, it's definitely not useless because it's the, everything that we can do, a mathematician, all of these rules, a mathematician has taken the definition and proved that it works. And once a proof has been made that it works, you can now use it as a shortcut. So someone had to, and when you're in university, you'll take these and you'll do the definitions and show why they work and then say we can now use that in any other situation that we have. I've got to erase all that green so it doesn't run into our next question. But once you've proven something, it becomes super powerful because it takes off so much time. Part B, we have some preliminary work to do. It's not yet in a form where we can do the derivative of each thing separately. So when you're doing these ones, first of all, before you take any derivatives, do some work to rearrange your equation so it's in a form that you can take the derivative of. And then, once you've got that, you can apply your power rule. which you could leave it like that or write it in a different form. Have you finished the next three already? Want to see the answer for C? Do the preliminary work. Find the derivative. Okay. Part of the thing about calculus, which is like once you've 
learned it, what we've done today, it's really not that hard. It's not a crazy amount of thinking or problem solving you have to do. But when somebody else looks at your work, like in this question, it started off like this. Then you did this changing with exponent laws. And then from the step to the derivative, kind of to a person that doesn't know the rule, it looks like magic. It's like, how do you know how to do this? And you'll be like, it's really not that bad. Now, I'm not saying go out to parties and take this out to impress people. That might not go over really well. <laughs> how are you? Do you want to see me do a derivative? <laughs> Hmm. Any ideas for D? What'd you do? Expanded it. And when you expand it, everything's in the form that you know how to do the derivative. So sometimes we have to do a little bit of creative math to get it into a form that we know how to do the derivative of. And as we go forward in this unit, there's going to be some times that we're going to say, oh, I don't like expanding it, or there must be a new rule we can create to make this easier. And the answer is yes. And our final example, working backwards. 20x cubed plus 5. Here is one answer. Is that the only answer? No. We could have had plus 5 or plus anything if you wanted. Okay? The key here is the fact that the question says find a or a function. <laughs> 